The mourners gather at the cemetery for the final stop. They get out of cars and come and encircle the casket, which has been reverently carried to the place holding platform. The body faces heavenward as the saints gaze their faces to the ground. The pastor robed faces east, facing the place of Jesus' birth, of Jesus' death, his life, and his return. The body of the deceased is between him and those gathered as these words, the first of the last of the appointed readings of Scripture for that funeral day, are solemnly spoken. Before we hear words of Paul that express a similar sentiment, we hear words like unto them from Jesus' own lips. It may be the only time Jesus spoke this way, this frankly, and with this image. Jesus' words captivate me. I have come to love them. I have come to pay more attention to them when I read them elsewhere, like tonight, because of where it is I am standing when I usually speak them. I want to know more about them. It has made me think about these words more deeply. The first thing I learn about these words is that they were spoken on Palm Sunday. Jesus had just arrived in the city of Jerusalem. The donkey ride lay behind him, and the cross lay ahead of him. Jesus tells the people gathered, specifically some Greeks who wanted to see him and had approached his disciples about that with the intent that they might possibly meet him, follow him, and go with him. In lofty poetry, Jesus speaks about the purpose of his death, words that have rung out to many mourners since. At this moment in our lives, as we stand at the grave, are we ready also to follow Jesus to suffering and to death? Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The first thing about these words is this. Jesus, as he does so often, steals the amen from your lips. He doesn't need your permission to die. He doesn't need your belief about what it does. He doesn't need you to acquiesce or accept what he is doing. The amen is supposed to be tacked on to the end and spoken by you in response to what he says. But here Jesus puts it first, himself saying it. Truth is not dependent upon what you think. It is based on the one who speaks it. Truly he wishes you to speak it also, the amen. But before you do, he speaks it in terms of an oath. Amen. He says, Amen. Amen. You should say it because, Amen, I have spoken. And Jesus then uses the image of wheat to speak about his body. There is the body, the enclosed physical substance of a kernel of grain, and there is his body, the word made flesh, and there are truths of comparison one can make between the two. As a farmer might treasure his grain, so we also see it natural to treasure our bodies. They're glorious. But what are bodies for, according to our Lord in this verse? Well, what if the farmer, Jesus bids us ask, could not accept nor was willing to sacrifice the treasures of grain that he had toiled for? So also our bodies for which we also wish to preserve. We may live our lives aiming to hold on and preserve our lives rather than losing them. Our willingness to hedge the truth, to save our skin, our feeling that we must do these things to live, whatever they may be, we betray ourselves as foolish farmers who wish only to hold on to what they have. What would you say of a farmer who treasured his cobs of corn and let his ground lay fallow? What would you say of a person who lived life 
only to treasure up his life and hold on to those treasures at all cost. In attempting to preserve in the end, all is lost. But Jesus, before he speaks of you laying down your life, he speaks first in this verse of himself and that week. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Jesus says what his life has come to. He's come as the seed of God. And what of his purpose? Nothing more than to be planted into the earth. What a waste of a life, we say. But no, Christ says. I look like ordinary grain. I look like all the others. But as a grain of wheat is planted and then shines forth glorious, waving in the autumn sun, ripe and glorious and victorious, so men will go from seeing me before my death is just another seed to that which, rising from the dead, I am seen for what I am and am acknowledged for what I came to be. We say it cannot, cannot be true that the death of man could do anything. We say it cannot be true that a man could come back to life. But we fail to see the pictures all around us and how God surrounds us constantly with his truth. A seed dies, it decays, it loses its former existence. It ceases to be what it was, but it takes on a new life and no longer continues in the same way that it was. But there, its life is carried on even as it gains even more life and lives again. In the seeds all around us, we have a picture of what God did through Jesus and what he does for us. We are the fruits of Jesus' death. He has produced life and grain for us. His resurrection is the life and fruit by which we eat. From the grain of his death and resurrection, from the pressing of the grain and his suffering and death, comes bread which is the fruit of eternal life for us. If a man eats of this bread, Jesus says, he will live forever. Christ died and through his death atoned for the sins of the whole world. Men through him receive his life. From grain comes life. But even as no weed is ever seen alone, but is in a field, so also Christ is the one weed in the field of grain. Yet one stalk is not seen by itself, but is seen by the sheaf that it stands with, even as we are joined and tied with Christ in his death. And even as in the harvest of grain is cut down, it does not remain alone. So we do not remain alone, but are with Christ who has suffered for us. Jesus did not aim to keep his life, but to give it. And so to all who walk in his way. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus, in this verse, speaks clearly of the Christian concept of sacrifice, and that being ultimately the greatest good. Our lives are not our own. Our lives, if we cling to them, we lose them. Only through sacrifice do we gain life because only in sacrifice do we become the image of the one who made us. So the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And the Bible says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. What are all these words but die words? Die to your way. Jesus invited us on this way of death when he invited us to baptism. Come down, drown. But who would wish that? It is why everyone comes kicking and screaming to his baptism. And yet by dying to the old ways through the water that God brings you to, you have risen to new ways. Losing the old life Buried there, you gain a new life. Losing the old man, you gain the new man. Losing the one body that must die, you gain the body which will live forever. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever keeps his life gains it for eternal life. And the world holds out this fear of death constantly before our eyes. It is the one lone trick of the world and the devil. 
Fear produces, as they think it, conformity. So imagine what it was like for Lawrence. He was the deacon of that church there in Rome, his good friend, the bishop. As the deacon, he helped the bishops and pastors of that town by tending to the management and distribution of funds for the poor, those in crisis, and the needs of the clergy. He was in charge of the offerings. And they came to his church, and they said, Produce the treasures of the church. The bishop and head of his congregation, his own friend, who he had traveled from his hometown years before with, had been killed just days previously. Give me three days to assemble it, he said. In those three days, Lawrence gathered, as legend would have it, the treasures of the church and gave them to the poor. Silver chalices, gold goblets, whatever it was, the gold and silver and expensive goods. He was willing to take all the things that had been given to the church and as the world would see it, merely discard them on nobodies. Imagine a beggar wearing a fine gold chasuble in the street. And then he gathered the poor three days later, the pastors that the church fed, the cripple, and the lame, the blind, and the maimed, and said with trembling voice to the authorities, Here, sirs, here are the treasures of the church. And to know when you said that what they would do to you, and yet to have formed in him through Christ in the way of baptism an unwillingness to hold on to it at all and to know that through death God would bring him to the wonders of eternal life and even by his death to encourage a young church and to make them bold and fearless against death and the threats of this world. Rome found a people and was amazed thereby, a people from which the threat of debt, the threat of death, was no threat at all. Learning to hate our life is the first way to learn to keep it for eternal life. Those who hate their life live on in eternal life, yet those who keep their lives in the end lose them. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.